what did this airplane, this airplane, and this airplane all have in common? We're going to tell you in this episode of Celebrating Aviation with Mike Machat. Today, we're going to talk about hybrids. The No, not these kinds of hybrids. These kind. Piston-powered airplanes that were boosted by jets, jet aircraft boosted by rockets, and jets with more jets, and turboprops, all sorts of combinations of aircraft uh, power plants in an amazing time in aviation history. This is a snapshot, kind of an overview of jet engine development from uh, the early 1940s to today. These are approximations. Please don't leave in the comment that I missed the thrust uh, rating by 150 pounds. Uh, but these are the families of engines that advanced uh, to where we are today, where a General Electric GE90 on a Boeing 777-300ER can produce 115,000 pounds of thrust, just one engine, which is more than twice uh, two complete Boeing 707s in 1958 and about one-tenth the noise. For this program, we're going to be concentrating on the first decade of jet power uh, from the early 40s to the early 50s. This was referred to as the blowtorch era, from the first jets to the beginning of supersonic flight with jet aircraft. The genius of Sir Frank Whittle and his jet engine, uh, which propelled the Gloucester E-2839 in 1941, really showed the world that jet power was the way of the future. But the credit for the first jet-powered airplane to fly goes to Germany for the Heinkel HE-178, which first flew in 1939. The first jet to see combat was the Messerschmitt Me 262 in the latter part of World War II. And America's first jet airplane was the Bell XP-59 era Comet, which flew at Muroc in October of 1942. It was powered by two General Electric 1A engines, which were actually license-built Whittle engines from England. The next family of engines, the Allison J-33 that you see here, uh, powered aircraft such as the Lockheed P-80 Shooting Star, and the T-33 uh, trainer, and uh, equivalent engines for the Republic uh, P-84 Thunderjet. The Navy aircraft included the Grumman F-9 Panther and the McDonald F-2H Banshee, uh, all, again, straight-wing airplanes at the very beginning of the jet age. Then there was a breakthrough. Uh, here on the left, you see the FJ-1 Fury, a straight-wing airplane. On the right, the North American FJ-2, a swept-wing airplane. And the swept-wing coupled with this engine, the General Electric J-47, uh, ushered in a new era with aircraft like the North American F-86 Sabre. These aircraft were what they called transonic. In a dive, they could ach achieve a supersonic speed. And this really was a breakthrough uh, in the next step for the jet age. What we see here is the Pratt & Whitney J-57. Uh, this was an engine that uh, produced 10,000 pounds of thrust. And with the afterburner, an additional three to 4,000 pounds for takeoff and dash speeds. This was used in the North American F-100 Super Sabre, the world's first aircraft to be able to achieve supersonic speed and level flight, as a pure jet, I should add. And the J-57 was also used in the Boeing Model 367-80, the prototype uh, jet transport, which became the Boeing 707, and really the predecessor of just about every modern jet airliner flying today. But in the piston era, we had the uh, epitome of piston power with the Pratt & Whitney R4360 that you see here, uh, referred to as the corn cob engine, 28 cylinder monster that produced uh, in its ultimate form 3,500 horsepower. And we see it here on a Boeing Stratocruiser. And the reason I show this is this is as good as it got. There was a need for more speed, even with these uh, powerful engines. Uh, an airplane that looked like a turboprop, but was actually a piston-powered aircraft with the 4360, was the Republic XR-12 Rainbow, to this day, the world's fastest four-engine piston-powered aircraft, uh, clocking in at 462 miles per hour at 40,000 feet in 1946. But it wasn't enough. And so we had props with jets. Well, <clears throat> there were test beds like this Lancastrian, uh, seen here with Rolls-Royce Neen engines in the outboard stations. You notice the props are feathered, the airplane's flying on jet power only. But these were test beds. A number of engines were tested on bombers and other large aircraft uh, at the end of World War II uh, to, get these, uh, to get these engines into uh, operational form. Uh, we had a P-51 with ramjets. Uh, there was a B-17 with a turboprop. 
any number of combinations that, again, were the very beginnings of uh, the turbine era. Then we have the B-36 Peacemaker, interesting name. It was the first airplane in the world ever designed uh, specifically so that it would never have to be used. It was a formidable deterrent weapon, a 10,000 mile unrefueled range, uh, carried a crew of 15. It was just a, a monster airplane powered by uh, six R4360 engines. And the need for speed uh, was achieved by uh, using a component from this airplane. The B-36 flew in 1946. A year later, we had the Boeing B-47. And if you look at those inboard uh, pods, those are two General Electric J-47s in a novel arrangement uh, hung under the wing on a pylon. And they literally took this and added it to the B-36. The B model shown here had the uh, four J-47s and it was referred to as six turning and four burning. Uh, and the uh, jets were used for takeoff and augmented thrust at altitude. Here we've got a B-36 with jets and its own jet escort. This is the FICON, which stood for fighter conveyor, uh, where a bomber would literally house its own uh, protective cover. And then the fighter would fly around and uh, take care of enemy airplanes. It was a, an interesting concept. It was way too complicated and way too costly. It was never put into operation. But at the beginning of the jet age, you had uh, <clears throat> refueling tankers that needed to keep up with the jets. And here we've got the KB-50, the Boeing uh, Super Fortress, with two J-47s on the outboard wing stations, as you see. Uh, airplanes like the Lockheed P-2V Neptune had Westinghouse J-34s to augment their twin uh, piston engines. You had airplanes like the Fairchild C-123 Provider and the uh, J model there with the uh, General Electric uh, J-85s. This is an interesting airplane, by the way. To my knowledge, it's the only airplane ever flown that uh, was flown as a glider, a piston-powered airplane, a pure jet airplane, and a piston aircraft with jet boost. Really a novel approach. Small jets were added to airplanes like the Fairchild C-119 packet. I'm sorry, the boxcar. This is the Fairchild C-82 packet, excuse me. And uh, this is an interesting airplane. It didn't fly passengers for TWA. It was a freighter. Uh, it was referred to as Antos, which is a Greek word for the thing. And this played a very interesting role. Uh, this was a freighter that took spare engines when airplanes like the <clears throat> TWA uh, 1649 Connies and even the uh, early Boeing 707s uh, had engine problems and were stranded uh, needing a spare engine anywhere in the world, usually in the Eastern Hemisphere. And uh, the C-82 made all sorts of uh, flights, bringing spare engines to these uh, stranded airplanes. Now, we did a little digging, did a little research, and we found the exact number of missions flown by Antos. Would you like to take a guess? It was 68. Unbelievable. All right, how about prop airplanes that became turboprops? Well, you had the C-124, old shaky, the Douglas Glowmaster II, converted uh, with turboprops into the YKC-124, and the K referred to a potential refueling mission, which did not come to pass. The Lockheed uh, WV-2 Connie, or uh, EC-121 Connie for the Air Force, converted to turboprops as the YC-121F, or R-7V-2 for the Navy. Uh, quite a good-looking airplane. Again, never went into production. The tanker roll fell to the Boeing KC-97. And here we see it again, modified with turboprops, but that wasn't the answer. And I'll show you how they solved that problem a little later on. What's a DC-3 doing in this collection? Well, the DC-3 or DST that you see here uh, was modified in Great Britain uh, with Rolls-Royce Dart engines. And yes, I know you're gonna tell me that the uh, Basler company in Oshkosh, Wisconsin converts uh, turbo DC-3s uh, with uh, Pratt & Whitney PT-6 turboprops that you see here. Uh, more than 80 of these airplanes have been built, and they're flying all over the world in uh, various uh, military and commercial applications. Another Douglas airplane that uh, lent itself to turbine power, at least as an experimental uh, version, the Douglas AD Sky Raider, which fitted with the uh, Allison T-40 turboprop with the contra-rotating propellers, became the XA-2D Sky Shark. Um, it was an interesting concept. The twin T-40s with the gearbox to the contra-rotating rotating propellers was so unbelievably complicated. Gearboxes shattered, 
they had any number of problems. They lost a number of airplanes and uh, quite a few designs were fitted with this power plant and none of them, unfortunately, uh, turned out to be successful. The North American AJ-2 Savage, itself a hybrid with a uh, uh, J-33 in the tail, augmenting the two piston uh, engines, uh, was converted to also T-40 turboprop as the uh, XA-2J Super Savage, again, an experimental airplane never put into production. All right, how about props that became pure jets? Well, this is interesting. The Douglas XB-42, uh, call it the Mixmaster, uh, became the XB-43 uh, Jetmaster. And this technically is America's first jet bomber, although it was not an operational airplane. The Northrop Flying Wing, uh, the YB-35 with the single prop seen here, uh, was converted into the YB-49 uh, with uh, Allison General Electric J-35s. And uh, well, here's a prop with a jet that became, oh, come on, really? Yeah, the Ryan Fireball had a right cyclone and a General Electric J31 uh, jet in the tail. And this was replaced by the XFR2 Dark Shark, which converted that uh, piston uh, power plant up front to a GE T31 turboprop. Talk about best of all worlds. Other famous turboprops are the uh, Republic XF-84H Thunder Screech, world's loudest airplane. Two were produced as experimental uh, uh, turboprops, T-40s, again, powering a supersonic propeller. Uh, underwhelming airplane, uh, hugely uh, uh, problematic with the noise. Uh, both the prototypes made a total of 12 flights, 10 of which ended in emergency landings. So what does that tell you? The McDonald XF-88 Voodoo converted to uh, Allison T-38 uh, shown here with the props feathered uh, with the airplane taking off in uh, pure jet uh, afterburner. Boeing XB-47 converted with right uh, T-49s on the inboard uh, stations there. And then there's the rocket boosted jets. We had, I showed you the P-51 and then we had a P-80 with uh, Ram jets. Again, these were strictly experimental. Uh, the uh, Extra power really didn't do much for the performance of the airplane, and uh, neither of these concepts were adapted. However, you've got the Douglas uh, D558-2 Skyrocket. This is an amazing airplane because it was flown as a pure jet, seen here with uh, JATO Assist on the lake bed at Edwards, and it was flown as a hybrid jet with rocket boost for low-level speed runs, and then as a pure rocket, which had to be air-launched from a converted B-29 bomber. Uh, the all rocket uh, D558 became the first airplane to fly at twice the speed of sound in 1953. The first airplane to uh, go Mach 1 in level flight was the Republic's XF 91 Thunder Scepter, uh, a J 47 powered aircraft with rocket boost. The French had the uh, Trident 1 and 2, seen here, an interesting uh, hybrid airplane. You had uh, Turbo Mecha turbojets on the outboard pods on the wingtips, uh, plus a three barrel rocket engine, uh, which would burn for three to five minutes and gave it a dash speed for intercepting enemy bombers. Another experimental aircraft is from uh, Great Britain, the Saunders Row SR 53 combination jet and rocket interceptor. And of course, we have the turbojet missiles, first cruise missiles uh, boosted by solid boosters. But did you know that? Uh, the Douglas DC-4 used by Braniff uh, for hot high operations in Mexico City actually used JATO assist for takeoff. And then the ultimate, uh, this is the ZEL concept. ZEL stands for zero length launch. Uh, this was, there were F-84s, this F-100 and even F-104 Starfighters all attempted to be launched from mobile uh, launchers for NATO uh, in Europe. Uh, and some tests were successful, but it was a tremendous uh, strain on the airplane and the pilot and ultimately was never used, but it looked cool. Here you've got a North American B-45 Tornado test bed carrying a Curtis Wright J-67. This again was fairly common uh, uh, through the jet age with uh, large aircraft carrying uh, other power plants to certify them in flight. So what was the ultimate solution to the need for speed? Well, you got your KC-97 hanging on for dear life as the uh, uh, B-47 uh, refuels behind it. And was the answer to add more jets and more power to the C-97? Well, here's a J-47 on a, a KC-97 tanker. 
Uh, these airplanes are seen at Rhein-Main Air Base in Germany. Uh, and believe it or not, they were fueled F-4s uh, on deployment. This photo was taken in 1972. Picture's worth a thousand words. No, the answer was this, a jet tanker. And I had to use the Ravel box top. What better image? <laughs> you know, KC-135 and full burner. Uh -huh. But uh, a pretty striking uh, image of what uh, really was the future of the Air Force. What's amazing, though, is that the KC-135, which first flew in 1956, and the B-52 that you see there first flew in 1954, are still flying today. They're re-engined. Uh, the B-52 is actually going to be re-engined yet again. And uh, there you see CFM-56 is on the KC-135. And it is theoretically said these airplanes are going to fly for uh, possibly another 20 years. Who would have ever thought? So by the 60s, you had jet engines uh, in uh, cars, the Bonneville Speed Racers at the Bonneville Salt Flats. Here we see uh, Craig Breedlove in the Spirit of America. And I saved the best for last. Remember that inboard pod on the B-47? Would you believe that they took this inboard pod, turned it upside down, and put it on a train? Yeah, that'll speed up your commute in the morning, won't it? Wow. So there you have it. A look at all the hybrid power plants, of props, jets, turboprops, at the very beginning of the jet age, all in the need for speed and technology. As always, special thanks to my dear friend, John Planetic, Leo Monahan and uh, Arab Classics editor Michael O'Leary for their tremendous support in uh, putting these presentations together. I want to thank you for celebrating aviation with Mike Bichette. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. And until next time, take care. <laughs>